Hello everyone, welcome to the show today is the business lecturer in within show every weekday from Monday Hello. to Friday to um, show, Monday to Friday at 4 p.m. where I come live here on YouTube to teach you guide you and provide you some assistance and answer your questions in relation to our preparation towards the ICA May 2020 examination if this is the first time you are joining us live, you can comment below with your questions and uh, share the channel as well, inform as much people as possible. You can share it on Facebook, make sure you tag me, share it on your WhatsApp platforms, make sure that we invite a lot of people to join the live broadcast today. But most importantly, this live broadcast on the business lecture in Wudin Show is meant to uh, address questions that you have. So if you're a fan of my work, you are following me and you join the broadcast every day or maybe you watch the playback every time, make sure you put it in the comment box or you put it in the chat box, topics that you want me to cover, uh, things that you want me to see, whatever topic it is, once it is in the ICA syllabus, whatever subject it is, once it's in the ICA syllabus, the new ICA syllabus, we will make it available and we will arrange and make it live here. So I provide you with some assistance that you need in order for you to prepare well for your examination. So comment below with all your questions. I'm going to be reading your questions as I go ahead with the discussion. And today, like you can see from the thumbnail as well as from the uh, uh, title, we are looking at financial reporting standards today and we are going to be discussing IFRS 15, that is revenue from contract with customers. One of the fundamental accounting standards that is uh, replacing a number of accounting uh, standards and it is critical for you to understand how we can recognize Organized revenue and not only that but also the accounting treatment of the revenue now I got uh, a suggestion and also a query from some students that um, I talk too fast when I am behind the camera so let me know if I talk too fast so I've decided to sort of slower a little bit I don't know if I talk too fast but if I do put it in the comment box ensure I slow a little bit because um, some people say they would have to set their players to a certain speed so that they can follow me at that pace because I go too fast. Um, I don't know about that too well, so just let me know. If I talk too fast during my presentations, just let me know. Put it in the comment box and I could uh, uh, work on that in relation to that so I can provide you with nothing but the best. But one thing is that Anytime I'm behind a camera, I'm very much excited about what I'm sharing, very passionate about what I'm producing. So maybe that is what gets ahead and makes me uh, talk faster. But like I said, I would want to move at a pace that you can cope with, move at a pace that the average person can cope with. So if you think that is true, put it in the chat box for me and tell me, Ishira, you move too fast move at a certain pace so that we can follow you the way we're going through. Now, today's discussion is going to be unique. We're going to be talking about IFRS 15. Listen to me carefully. If you know a friend that is doing financial reporting or corporate reporting, that must watch this lecture live and ask questions. Share the video with the person on WhatsApp. Share the video with the person on Facebook Messenger or share the video on Facebook anywhere and invite them to come on board because I'm going to be going through everything in IFRS 15. Then we're going to be solving some questions along the line. So I have a couple of questions put down that we're going to be solving along the line and deal with the minor issues one after the other so we understand the concept properly and address every question that we are given in the exam hall so we can successfully pass the exams. So this standard applies to both students writing corporate reporting as well as financial reporting because it's a fundamental standard and it's a basic standard. Again, if you're just joining the broadcast, it is the business lecturer in Wudin Show and every day, Monday to Friday, 4 p.m., I go live on YouTube to teach you. But like I said all the time, or I say all the time, 
this lecture is designed based on the queries of students so i have a list of topics here that students have requested and one of them is what i'm treating today ifrs 15. so if there is any topic that you would want me to cover any subject that you want me to go deeper on don't give me subjects give me topics okay because when you give me subject that is too vague that is too broad give me specific topics and I will, we will arrange that and make it live for you here on the channel and remember sus, uh, subscribe to the channel share the video with as much people as possible so we get more people to come on board Ofori, uh, Richard, thank you very much. Welcome to the show. I'm very much excited that you are here. Um, I think Samuel and then Ebenezer, they, are, they may not be here yet, but whatever it is. If you are here, Samuel and uh, Ebenezer, comment below and let me hear from you. I think yesterday Ebenezer called me and shared her, uh, sorry, his uh, uh, pleasure and happiness on what he finds on the channel and it was it was refreshing to hear from him how he finds the channel productive and how the channel has helped him in relation to his preparation so comment below if you are here with the questions that you have with everything that you have on your mind for me so let's get into the discussion ifrs 15 revenue from contracts with customers revenue from contracts with customers. Now, this accounting standard is actually replacing some new accounting standards. Um, Opoku uh, Young, Papa Opoku, I'm here. It is here, yeah, Opoku, you are welcome. Thank you for joining the broadcast today. Remember to share the video on social media everywhere so we get a lot of people to come. Evans, uh, Chachu, uh, let, me, let me read from here rather. Let me see what I have. Chachu uh, Sakotosis. I'm Chachu watching from Koforidua. Now, if I pronounce your name wrong, please forgive me, okay? It's not intentional, you know it, right? So I will just be mentioning your first name to avoid anything. So Chachu, yeah, thank you for watching. Much love to people in Koforidua, your colleagues and others. Tell them to jump on. Very much excited that you make time to join me every single day on the show. So we go into IFRS 15 and this is what I want you to do. As you are watching this, whatever question that comes in your mind, if you can, type it in the comment box immediately. If you cannot, you write it down. So because I would want to answer questions real time, okay? So if you can, whatever I'm talking about, maybe you don't understand something I explained, quickly you just put it in the chat box and I'm going to be answering it. Now, if you are watching the replay of this lecture also, you can still put it in the comment box. I read all your comments and I'm going to reply to all your comments personally. No one does that. I do it personally. No one does that for me. So, IFRS 15, revenue from contracts with customers. Now, this standard is replacing a number of IFRSs for uh, recognition of revenue but most importantly it is also replacing two accounting standards that is IAS 18 revenue and IAS 10 construction contract so these two accounting standards are now have now been replaced by IFRS 15 revenue from contract with customers so what is it about now you know that in IAS 18 uh, primarily we recognize revenue as and when the transaction takes place and we don't really take into consideration a lot of factors and in IAS 10 also construction contracts you know how it is done you calculate the percentage of completion and do all of that all of these standards have between them some or within them some limitations on how revenue should actually be accounted for and recognized that is why the uh, International uh, Accounting Standard Board issued the IFRS so that we can uh, use IFRS 15 that provides very importantly uh, a principle based approach to the revenue recognition so when it comes to IFRS 15 it is a principle based approach and you are guided by that principle in the recognition of revenue under the standard in the books of a company so what are these principle based it is called the five step framework or the five step approach 
in revenue recognition. So the five-step framework for revenue recognition. In other words, before we can recognize revenue in accordance with IFRS 15, we must follow these five steps. And these five step is stages. You cannot do step four before step one. You cannot do step five without step one. You cannot do step three without step two. It has to follow in that order. So I'm going to list the five steps down and then we're going to take them one after the other and dive a bit deeper into them, solve questions in each of the steps so that you understand how the steps actually apply to revenue in relation to that. So step one is identification of contract. Step two is identification of performance obligation. PO is performance obligation. Three is determination of transaction price. So determination of TP transaction price. And then also, and then also, and then also we have allocation of transaction price to performance obligation. And then the fifth thing is you recognize revenue as, so recognition of revenue. As or when performance obligation is satisfied. So these are the five step framework we follow in the recognition of revenue in accordance with IAS, oh sorry, IFRS 15. You identify the contract with the customer, you identify the performance obligation, you determine the transaction price. You allocate the transaction price to the performance obligation, certainly using their standalone prices. I'll get there in a moment. And then you recognize revenue when or as a performance obligation is satisfied. So these are the five steps. Like I said, you cannot do five without one. You cannot do three, four without two. You, it has to follow in that step. So what we're going to be doing now is to take them one after the other and dive a bit deeper into it in relation to how they help us to identify or uh, to recognize revenue in our books. So step one, identification of contract with customers. Now, the starting point for IFRS 15, it's always to identify a contract with customer. Now, the contract can be in a writing form, it can be in a verbal form, or it can be an implied contract. However, whatever it is, there has to be an agreement between the entity and then the potential customer. Now, in order for us to say we are identifying a contract with a customer, there are a couple of recognition or conditions that must be met for us to fulfill the offer, for us to say, okay, this is a contract with customer. Because remember, we are talking about revenue. But before we come to the fifth step, which is the recognition of revenue, you must identify one, the first, the contract with all the customer. So how do we identify contracts with customers? Four key things that you must understand. Number one, Number one, so uh, in order to, uh, for the IFRS 15 to apply, the following what must be made for us to say we have identified a contract. Number one, the contract is approved by all parties. The contract is approved by all parties. So what does that mean then? You come to me and you say, insurer, I want you to teach me for the ICA exams two months. Okay, I'm gonna charge you $5,000, okay. Have we agreed on the date and everything? Boom, that is the first step. Both parties, that is the entity and then the customer or the client must agree and approve to the contract. Two, the rights and payment terms can be identified. 
So your right, what are you going to be having? My right, what are you, am I going to have it? What is the payment term? So you say, okay, Ishira, I want you to teach me for two months. What is your right then? Your right is that I'm going to be teaching you. What is my right? Is that you're going to be paying me the money. Then we need to agree on the terms of payment. I said I'm going to charge you $5,000 for two months. So what is the terms of payment? Maybe you pay 70% on start and then the 30% one month after start, after the class. So that is the second thing. With the right end, payment term have been identified. Three, the contract has a commercial substance. Very, very important. The contract has a commercial substance. Now, what does that mean? It means that there is a value on the contract. So the example I'm using now, you come to me, Insura, teach me for two months for the ICA, and I say, okay, I'm going to teach you for the two months, but I'm going to charge you $5,000. That becomes what? The $5,000 becomes the commercial substance. But if you come and say, Insura, please help me to pass the exams, I don't have anything to pay, then in the first place, there is no revenue to be what? Recognized. In the first place, it means that there is no contract to be identified because I'm not going to get anything from this deal. I'm not going to get anything from this contract. But the fourth thing, which is one of the critical issues about identification of contract with customers is it is probable that revenue will be collected. It is probable that revenue will be collected. So if you come to me, Ishira, teach me for uh, two months for the IEC, and I say, I'm going to charge you $5,000, I should be able to assess whether you're going to be able to pay me the $5,000. Now, if I assess and I realize that you cannot pay me the $5,000, it means that in the first place, since the revenue is not probable to be received, then we cannot identify the contracts with any customer because you cannot pay me the fee that I'm not charging you. But if it is probable that you're going to be able to pay me, I'm going to be able to collect the money, then we can what? Identify the contract with customer. So that is the first step about uh, dealing with IFRS 15, identification of the contract with customers. Both all parties must approve the contract. The payment terms and rights must be uh, identified. The Contract must have some commercial value and then it should be probable that the revenue will be collected by the entity. That is the first thing, identification of contract with customers. Then we come to the second step, which is identification of performance obligation. Identification of performance obligation. Now, what is performance obligation? In a simple language, Performance obligation refers to what the entity is going to do in return for the consideration being received. Let me take that again. Performance obligation refers to what the entity is going to do in return for the consideration or revenue being received. So it could be the delivery of goods, it could be the rendering of what? Service. So whatever the entity must do to the client, to the customer, in return for the consideration they are receiving, is all refers to as what? The performance obligation. So, let's dive deeper into our illustration. You say, if you have teach me for two months, for the ICA, uh, then I charge you $5,000, you agreed, period. Then I tell you tell me that, Ishira, in the $5,000, what am I going to get? Then I say, okay, the $5,000 is going to be giving you teaching. So I'm going to be teaching you also tuition. Maybe let me put it that way. Tuition. You're going to have my books as well. So you're going to have ebooks for free. Then as part of it also, I'm going to uh, assist you in relation to your revisions. I'm going to give you some revision kits. Then you're going to have access to my complete course online on my study portal. So courses, online courses. Now, if this is the package detailed, then this becomes what? The performance obligation. So for the $5,000 that you are paying me, what am I doing under the contract? That is what we call the performance obligation. So for instance, if a telecommunication company 
runs a promotion and they say that oh we're going to give you a phone and uh you have to pay an annual uh, thing and literally the phone is free that means that their performance obligation is going to be the phone that they're going to give you as well as what the network or the data service that they're going to be providing you so performance obligation means what the entity is going to be doing so when we identify the contract yes we have agreed yes we know how much you paid we need to also identify what are we doing under the contract that is the identification of the performance obligation then we come to the third thing once i know now that if i'm going to be teaching you for two months for the five thousand dollars these are the things that i'm going to be doing we go to the third step that is determination of the transaction price determination of tp the transaction price the transaction price now the transaction price refers to literally how much that we're going to be receiving in the under the contract so from our illustration for instance you are paying me five thousand dollars so automatically that becomes what the transaction price however the transaction price can also be uh, fixed, taking into consideration other factors. So not only how much you are directly paying me, but there will be other factors that goes into how we determine the transaction price of a contract. Three of those factors are critical. The first one is significant financing component. Now, sometimes as part of the contract, it's going to be like, for instance, the way some companies do, Come and buy TV, pay for 12 months, no interest. It is a lie. Okay? They say interest free. It's a lie. There is always interest on it because you are they are not Father Christmas to give you the things free so you pay it when you like. No. If you check the cash price of the product somewhere, you realize that that product is say maybe thousand cities. But because they are giving you that 12 month installment, they will tell you 1150 or 1002. Now, the question is, what is the extra for? It is financing. So when we are determining the transaction price of a contract, the first component that will be part is the significant what? Financing component. So for instance, if I tell you that, okay, you, you said, okay, Inshira, I'm charging you $5,000 for the two months, but you said, Inshira, you cannot pay, I cannot pay 70% on the start of the class. So I said, okay, if that is the case, then you can pay me after the class, but if you are going to pay me after the class, you are going to pay $5,500. It means that that extra $500 I'm adding is the financing component to take care of the time value of money to be specific in relation to that. Then the second component of determination of the transaction price is the variation consideration, variation consideration. Now, this has to do with changes in the future. Maybe uh, the contract we are undertaking, the price is not fixed. So maybe it's a long-term contract. But as and when the year goes by, inflation and stuff will come in and we can vary the selling price or the consideration we're receiving. Then the third thing is refunds and uh, rebates that is payment to the customer that is what it's likely to happen if we are not able to fulfill our performance obligation if we need to refund to the customer the cost of the refund is also going to be what considered these are what you have to understand when we talk about the issue in relation to the transaction price so what are we saying ifrs 15 is an accounting standard that is traditionally re replacing IAS 18 and IAS 10. Under the IFRS 15, it adopts a principle-based approach in the recognition of revenue. This principle-based approach is what is defined or recommended or mentioned as the five-step framework for the revenue recognition. So what are these five-step frameworks? We look at identification of the contracts. We look at the performance obligation. We look at the transaction price. We look at the location of the transaction price to performance obligation. And then we recognize revenue as and when uh, transaction uh, performance obligation is satisfied. Then we 
spoken about the identification of the contract. What did we say? We said that the parties must approve the contract. All parties to the contract must approve it. There should be a commercial value. The third thing we mentioned is that it should be probable that we are going to be receiving the money and then the, uh, uh, the payment terms and the rights must also be determined. Performance obligation, we said this is what the entity is going to be doing under the contract in return for the consideration that is going to be receiving under the contract. So what are we going to be doing? Is it selling goods? Is it rendering services? Or is it rendering one-time service or even continuous services? That will all be identified under the step three, which is the Sorry, step two, which is the identification of performance obligation. And then the third thing is determination of the transaction price. How much are we actually going to be getting or receiving under this contract? So under determination of transaction price, let's look at an illustration here to find out how we're going to be identifying it. So I'm going to read a question out uh, for you so that in case we're writing, you can write, and we're going to be solving that question. So, uh, this is from the Open Tuition. So, uh, for those of you who are doing financial reporting, it's a good material, very summarized, give you the core principles that you need in relation to that. So, the question I'm actually going to be discussing with you here is from the Open Tuition book. You can get it on their website opentuition.com and uh, you can get uh, the PDA version of this question but I'm going to read it to you as well probably from tomorrow we'll beam it on the uh, on the screen so that you can see it in, in relation to that we didn't factor that in today Lucas Cole sells a car to a customer for $50,000 I want you to listen to the question carefully Lucas Cole sells a car to a customer for ten thousand dollars offering interest-free credit for a three-year period listen to the language offering interest-free credit for three thousand for three years period the car is delivered to the customer immediately the annual market rate of interest on the provision of customer credit to similar customers is five percent required what is the transaction price? So Lucas is selling a car to a customer, ten thousand dollars, but it is offering it interest-free uh, credit for three-year period. Meaning that, in addition to the ten thousand dollars that the car is worth, you are not going to be paying any additional financing on it. It, it means that embedded in that ten thousand, the company has already factored in the financing deal for you. So the examiner is saying that the annual market rate on similar deals is 5%. So how then do we get the transaction price, which is the, the money we're going to be getting actually for delivering the car to the customer? Now, since you see this, you realize that the customer is going to pay $10,000 over a period of three years. So in order for us to find the transaction price, we discount the $10,000 into present terms using the market rate given as the discount factor. How we are getting the treatment. So we discount the $10,000 into present terms using the uh, market rate given as the discount factor. And the figure we get is what is referred to as the transaction price. So let's crunch the numbers. So from the Lucas question, we say that the transaction price will be equal to the $10,000 we are receiving divided by 1 plus 0 0.5, which is a 5% exponent 3. I hope you are getting it. This is coming from the concept of the discount factor. It is 1 over 1 plus R exponent N. N refers to the number of periods. Here we are told that the number of periods is 3. The R is the market rate or the interest rate. In this question, we are told it is 5%. So the ten thousand dollars, how much we're going to be receiving for the car, divided by one point zero five exponent three, and then when we crunch that out, we're going to be having. Let me see what I got here. Eight thousand six hundred and thirty-eight. Eight thousand six hundred and what? Thirty-eight. So that becomes what we refer to as what? 
the transaction price. I want you to make sure you get this very, very wrong well because the examiner could play tricks on you in the exam hall and you will be freaked out and not know what you are supposed to do. So in such circumstances, this is how you get your transaction price. Now, I know you are asking that, okay, Shira, if I get a transaction price, what do I use or what do I do with the transaction price? We're going to be going to it in step four and then you will see what you do with the transaction price. So that is the third step and a determination of the transaction price. Now, after we determine the transaction price, remember, if there are any questions you have, put it in the comment box or put it in the chat box. I'm going to be reading all your questions and reply to you real time like this if you are watching live. But if you are watching the playback also, you can put it in the comment box. I will come and comment on that for you as well. So now we've done step one. We've identified a contract. Step two, we've looked at what we're going to be doing. Step three, we've determined how much money we're going to be receiving. Now let's move on to step four. This is where it starts to get interesting. So make sure you pay close attention and you understand the concept very well. Allocation of transaction price to performance obligation. Allocation of transaction price to performance obligation. Now, we have identified that from our example that we are using, with, like with you, you will employ me, you say I should teach you for two months, I'm charging you $5,000. So the $5,000 is the transaction price. But remember in step two, we identified what? The performance obligation. And we listed them here. And I said, I will be giving you tuition, I will be giving you my free books, I will be giving you revision kits, and I will be giving you uh, our online courses. So these are the performance obligation. Now, I'm doing four things for you, but you are giving me only $5,000. So the standard says that the $5,000 that I'm receiving, which is the transaction price, should be allocated to the performance obligations using their standalone prices. Are you getting the picture? So we allocate the transaction price, the $5,000 you are giving me, we share it. We share it among these performance obligations. That is what we're talking about here. So let's look at how we allocate the transaction price. So let me use an example here and I'll illustrate it here Then we pick the question that we have in the book. So let's say that, now what, what, what is the standard loan price? I mentioned that. The standard loan price refers to how much that particular good or that particular uh, product or service will be sold. That is the standard loan price. So, you are giving me $5,000 to teach you for two months and I'm giving you these four things. Tuition, books, revision kits, online courses. So you're giving me $5,000. Now, so what are the standard loan prices? If I'm doing only tuition for the two months and uh, it is not uh, packaged like this, how much will it be? For the two months, let's say I'm going to charge $4,000. If I'm giving you books only, my books would have cost you $1,000. If I'm giving you revision kits, only the revision kits would have cost you, say, $800. And then the online course would have cost you $2,000. So these are the standalone prices. These are the standalone prices. So if you look at the standalone prices, we add them up. Tuition is $4,000. Books is thousand making five thousand. Revision kit is eight hundred making five thousand eight hundred, and then courses is two thousand making seven thousand eight hundred. So in total, I'm giving you seven thousand eight hundred value for just what five thousand dollars. So the fourth step: allocate transaction price to performance obligation using the standalone prices is. Sharing the five thousand that I'm actually going to be receiving among these guys. So put, let's let me put a pro forma down here for you. So we're gonna have the product or service here, okay? Then we're gonna have their stand alone prices here. I'm just right. Let me let me write it much clearer on that because it's a key pro forma. 
So let's put a product here, okay, or service that we're going to be rendering. Then we're going to have the standalone prices. Standalone price, all right, in the middle. So tuition, books, revision kits, and then courses or online courses. This is four thousand. This is one thousand. This is eight hundred. This is two thousand. Giving us a total of seven thousand eight hundred dollars. I follow the picture. Seven thousand eight hundred dollars. So we bring the products. We bring the standalone prices. Then now we look at the allocation. So allocation of the transaction price. So how do we allocate? Okay, how do we allocate? This is going to be four thousand over the total seven thousand times the transaction price I received from you was how much? Five thousand. That is our transaction price. So that is what we are allocating. So times five thousand. Okay. Let me extend this to here a little bit. Five thousand. This is going to be thousand over seven thousand. Still five thousand. Eight hundred over seven thousand. Still five thousand. So that is how we want allocate the transaction price to performance obligation. I hope you see the proof form. So products. Stand at low prices, then we deal with what? The allocation. Always, the allocation must sum up to the transaction price that we calculated in step two or that will be given in the question. Almost always, you're going to be the one to calculate the transaction price. It's not going to be given to you directly. It, it will be put in such a way that you would have to what? Calculate the transaction price and do the allocation in relation to that. So that is how we go about it. I'm not going to put the figures down. You can punch them on your own. And then let's look at our second question here. And this question is under allocation of uh, the transaction price. Richard Cole sells home entertainment system, including a two-year repair and maintenance package. Richard Cole sells home entertainment systems, including a two-year repair and maintenance package for $10,000. The price of a home system without the repair and maintenance contract is $9,000, and the price to renew a two-year maintenance contract is $2,000. Required. How is the $10,000 contract price allocated to the separate performance obligation? Allocated to separate performance obligation. So let's see how we deal with this. Let me clean this up. So let's get the preambles in the question again. Richard Cole sells um, an entertainment system including a two year repair and maintenance package. So get it rough. They sell an entertainment system, like maybe whatever, entertainment system. Then, in addition to the entertainment system, you're going to get a two year repair and maintenance package. So you're getting two things for $10,000. So from this question, our transaction price is what? $10,000. Now, the first thing is identification of the contract with customer. Have we identified? Yes, from the question, it shows that uh, we have sold the product to the customer, so the contract is certainly identified. Then the second thing we need to ask is, what are we giving in this contract? You realize that uh, Richard Cole, okay, under this contract is giving two things. The home entertainment system, home entertainment system, the home entertainment system, I'm going to do H-E-S for that, and then 
a four year repair, sorry, a two, is it two years? A two year repair and what? Maintenance. Two year repair and maintenance. And I'm gonna do R and M for that as the new one. So that is what? The performance obligation. So have we identified a contract? Yes. Uh, once the product has been sold to the customer, it means we have identified a contract. Step two, what is Richard Cole going to be doing? He will be giving them a home entertainment system and then what? A repair and maintenance. Then let's come to uh, the transaction price. I've already put that up there. And that is the transaction price and that is $10,000. So we've had step one ticked, step two ticked, step three Tick. However, step four is where we are, the allocation, the allocation. Now, for these two services, if Richard Cole was doing them differently, that is, was selling the entertainment system differently, the examiner said they would have sold it for $9,000. So that is the standalone price. So let me put it there, standalone prices. For the whole entertainment system, that would be $9,000. You good? And then the repair and maintenance, R and M, that would be $2,000. So these are the standalone prices. So we're going to be using the standalone prices as the benchmark to allocate the transaction price, which is how much? $10,000. So let's see how we go about that. So like I put it down, like I put it down, we could go straight and then uh, look at how we uh, calculate or allocate the transaction price. So if you add the two, that is going to be how much? $11,000, simply, simply like that. So allocation, I'm giving you another way of presenting the information. Allocation of the transaction price, we could say that for the home entertainment system, it is going to be $9,000 divided by $11,000, okay, times the transaction price, which is $10,000. So that is from the home uh, uh, system, the home entertainment system. Then for my repair and maintenance, that is going to be $2,000 over $11,000 times what? 10,000. I hope you are getting the picture. So that is how we allocate. So if we punch these out, we should get 8,182 here, and then we should get 1,818. So this is what we mean by the allocation of the transaction price to performance obligation. Now, why is this important? This is important because of the fifth step. Okay? This is important because of the fifth step. And what is the fifth step? The step five is you recognize revenue as or when a performance obligation is satisfied. That is the primary thing. So all you've done so far, you're not going to be recognizing anything. But the fifth thing is about recognizing revenue when or as a performance obligation is satisfied. So what does that mean? It means that, for example, for the Richard Cole question we're going for, if they give them the home PR system, then they can recognize revenue. Now. In, in recognition of the revenue, we have to look at the issue about transfer of control. So at what point will we say control of the asset has been transferred to the uh, customer or to the client? Five things gives us a clue in relation to that. One, present rights to payment for the assets, meaning that the, if the client has the present right for the payment of the assets, it means that we can conclude that he is now owning the asset, so he has it and he's going to be paying for it. Two, transfer legal title to the asset. Okay, 
the accent is in my name or was in my name now it is in your name so it means that we have satisfied a performance obligation three transferred physical possession of the asset all right what you bought books from me and we've sent the books to you so it means that what the performance obligation has been fulfilled and then four transfer the risks and rewards of the ownership to the customer so any risks and rewards relating to the asset has been transferred to the customer so once the risks and reward has been transferred we are no more responsible uh we are no more the ones who enjoy any uh revenue from the usage of the assets then it means that we are going to or we cannot recognize revenue because we have satisfied the obligation and then the fifth thing is customer has accepted the asset so we've sent to the customer and the customer has acknowledged and said that he has identified or accepted the asset so these are the five steps identify revenue step one um, identify performance obligation step two determine transaction price step three allocate transaction price to performance obligation step four and then step five you recognize revenue as and when performance obligation is satisfied now i want you to get the last part carefully because this is where students get it wrong so make sure you get the last statement carefully revenue recognition can be done at and revenue recognition can be done over two things so when it comes to the fifth step revenue recognition you don't just jump and identify something as revenue because revenue can be recognized at or and at the same time recognize what over what does that mean because we are talking about the fact that performance obligation is going to be satisfied when uh, uh, or we will recognize revenue when we satisfy performance obligation that means that at the date of the contract if we do something to the customer or we give something to the customer or we perform one of our obligations then we can recognize what revenue then then after that date of the revenue recognition the rest of the items will be recognized what over the period so what does that mean let me use the example by richard Cole that we are using here so you realize that the home entertainment system is 18 one sorry one eight one eight two then the repair and maintenance is one eight one eight now which of these two must you recognize at and which of these two must you recognize over at the inception of the contract you could see from the question the examiner said we sell a home theater to the customer and attached to that there is a two years repairs and maintenance uh, package so at the date of the sales what have we done have we done any repair no we've not done any repair yet but what have we done we've given uh, the customer the home theater so since we've given the customer the home theater the revenue from the home theater is recognized as part of our revenue so at the date of the signing of the deal or at the date of giving the customer the home theater we recognize revenue okay one eight or eight one eight two so in our income statement that is the only revenue we recognize now remember in total the customer is paying ten thousand dollars but you're not going to be recognizing the ten thousand dollars because this time after the date what have you done you've only given the customer your home tier now the repair and maintenance spreads over two years the repair and maintenance spreads or goes over two years so the allocation of the repair and maintenance that is the 18 18 dollars will be recognized over a period of what two months in other words this 18 18 is recognized as a deferred income and amortized over the uh, period of what two years i hope you get the idea so recognition of revenue is asked when the contract takes place what did we do we recognize that 
then the difference will be recognized over that will be recognized as a deferred income in our balance sheet or statement of financial position under current uh, liabilities as a deferred income under current liabilities depending on the number of time if it is like two years like this maybe we will spread some will come to current liabilities some will come to non-current liability but you are recognizing it as what a deferred income that is what you have to understand about this now let's look at a question that has everything inside so we're going to be now putting all the pieces together and let's see how we can practically solve a full question so let's see oh um, okay i want to make sure i saw a, a, a nice question okay so let's go um Lever tech is a computer business that primarily sells computer hardware. Levertech is a computer business that primarily sells computer hardware. As well as selling computers, it also supplies and installs the software to its customers and provides a technical support package over two years. I want you to listen to this carefully and provide a technical package over two years. Um, the business commonly sells the supply and installation and technical support in a combined goods and service contract. So the uh, installation with the technical support, they sell it in one deal, in one deal like that. The combined goods and services sells for $1,600. But if sold separately, the supply and installation is sold for $1,500 and the technical support for $500. Required. If Libertech sold a combined contract on 1st July 2017, 20X7, demonstrate how the transaction will be presented in the financial statements for the year and the 31st December 20x5. So let's see the preambles in the question. Remember the steps and remember the idea about over and at. Very, very important. We go. So let's go. Libertech. So let's put the name of the company down. So Levertech. So Levertech is a computer business that primarily sells computer hardware. Um, so uh, the requirement is if Levertech sold a combined contract on 1st July 2007. Now if they are selling, it means we have identified what? The contract with customers already. So we come to step two, the performance obligation. Now, what is Libertech selling in combination? So, if you check, the performance obligation here includes two things. That is, supply and installation of the computer. So, supply and installation of the computer. That is the first thing they do. And then the second thing is to provide what? Technical support. So these are the performance obligation. These are the things that uh, Libertech Limited is going to be doing. Then we come to the third step and we determine the uh, transaction price. How much are we getting from this deal? We are told that TP, transaction price, Libertech is selling this deal for $1,600. So the transaction price is $1,600. You get that? That's the, that's the next step. But we are told that if Libertech should sell these things separately, these are the standalone prices, they will sell the supply and installation for $1,500. So this would have been $1,500. And then the technical support would have been what? $500. So they are selling a $2,000 service for what? $1,600. 
Now let's look at the question carefully because we will be able to determine the dates and all of that that is happening. The sales took place on 1st July 2007 and the year ended of the company is 31st December 2007. Why is that important? Because again here you must identify what should be recognized at and you must recognize uh, and identify what should be recognized over the period of what? Two years. Very important. So how do we put the pieces together? Let's allocate, that is the third step, allocate the transaction price to the performance obligation. So first we talk about supply and installation and that is going to be now, the addition of these two is $2,000. So it's going to be $1,500 over $2,000 times the transaction price of $1,600. Then technical support, TS, is going to be $500 over $2,000 times the same $1,600. So let's crunch the numbers up. Let's see what we have for that. For the supply and maintenance, we're going to have 1,200. So certainly for this, we're going to have 400. So that is the allocation. Now, after you allocate, we say that you what? Recognize the revenue as and when a performance obligation is satisfied. So how do you recognize the revenue as and when a performance obligation is satisfied? Remember, at and over. So let's look at the issue about at and over. Which of these two will be recognized at the date of the sales and which of these two will be recognized over the period of two years? Certainly, at the date of the sale, the customer is going to have the computers and the installation. So supply and installation will be recognized at the date of, recognition, uh, of the sales and that is $1,000. $200. And then the service, the technical support service, will be recognized over a period of what? Two years. So the 400 for the support service will be recognized over a period of two years. Now, go back to the question. The examiner said the year ended of the company is 31st December 20x7. But they made the sales on 1st July 2007. So in the financial statement, what are the things that are going to be coming in the financial statement? So first, we refer the statement of financial performance. Remember, this is just an extract. Now, this is just an extract. So how do we go about it? Revenue. So what revenue do we recognize? Remember, for the year ended 31st December what? 2087. So what revenue do we recognize? We recognize the 1,002 at 1,200. And then, can you, do you see that the service cost, the technical support, we've done six months? Can you see that? Because we made a sales on 1st July. And the technical support is over two years. So from 1st July to 31st December, we've done six months of the odds, technical support. So two years is 24 months, and so we've done six months of that. So we're going to recognize it as part of the revenue for the year ended 31st December 20x4, or sorry, 20x7. So that is going to be 6 over 24, let me put this in another bracket, 6 over 24 times the four hundred dollars. Okay, so this is the technical support, the over aspect. That is it there. Then uh, the thousand two hundred, the ads. So when you do the arithmetic and add the two, that should give you one thousand three hundred. So for the year ended thirty first December twenty X seven, we recognize one thousand three hundred in respect of what the revenue, in respect of the revenue. Then we come to the statement of financial position. Remember, that is also an extract for the year ended under consideration. Now, what is going to come in the statement of financial position? What is left? Okay? Now, remember, you did six months here. So, 
the the you have to like I mentioned because it's a it's covering uh how do we call it? It's going to cover the whole of two years. You must find out okay which one is going to be current liabilities and which one is going to be what non-current liabilities. So if you've done the first six months, then you're going to be doing what the next six months. So in the statement of financial position, again, this is an extract for the year ended 31st of December 2007. Under non-current liabilities, okay, under non-current liabilities, we're going to be recognizing deferred income. Deferred income. And then under current liabilities also, the same thing, deferred income. Now, how much do you think must come in the current liability component and then how much do you think must come in the non-current liability component? Now remember, the year has ended. So the following full year, we must do the service. So the next full year will come to the current liability and then the six months going into uh, 20, uh, X9 will come as what? Well. Uh, a deferred income and a non carrier liability. So this is going to be 12 over 24 times the 400, and that is going to give us um, $200. Now remember, you took 100 years, so the 100 will become what? The non carrier liability. This is what you do in IFRS 15 revenue from contract with customers. So you see how. We put all the pieces together. You see how we put all the pieces together. So you recognize the transaction with a customer, first step. Second step, you determine your performance obligations. Third step, you must know your standard, standard loan prices. And then you allocate. After the allocation, you find out which one must I recognize at and which one must I recognize over. Any questions so far? So these are what you have to understand about it. Now, because of time constraints, I have to continue with this uh, tomorrow, okay? I need to continue with this tomorrow because we are left with dealing with the, uh, all these things we've dealt with is about the IAS 18 aspect. Remember I told you this standard is replacing two core standards, IAS 18 and IAS 10, con construction contracts. So I'm going to be ending here today on the aspect of the IAS 18 so that tomorrow we will continue with the aspect of the IAS 10 and see how we can recognize revenue when a performance obligation is supposed to be done over a long period of time in a typical construction contract environment. So this is the answer to the question on labor tech and thank you very much for joining the broadcast today if there are any questions i'm going to be waiting in the next few minutes like two minutes if there are any questions please put them in the comment box if you are watching the replay also you can put your questions in the chat box uh, or in the comment box and i'm going to be answering all your questions for you live i believe that you now understand ifrs 15 revenue from contract with customers it's very simple but the third, the fourth step and the fifth step is where the issue starts happening when you are allocating your revenue in, or your transaction price to the performance obligation. So you comment below with any questions that you are having in relation to uh, that because tomorrow I'm going to be continuing with the IES 10 aspect. Remember, Make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you have not subscribed to the channel and make sure you share the video with, with as much people as possible. There are a lot of people out there and uh, if we can get a video to them, we can get a channel to them, we can uh, together assist a lot of people as much as possible so that we can all prepare for the examination and ultimately pass the examination. My objective for this live broadcast is to be able to come in like this, provide you with the understanding like this. Now, as I finish with this, you're going to solve a lot of questions, okay? So make sure you get the ICA question kit. I've said that to you before. Get an ICA question kit. 
solve questions that are inside as much as you can to build your understanding well so that when you get to the exam hall and you see the question you don't freak out you're able to do what you need to do in order for you to get the marks that the marks that you are supposed to get so richard ofori papa opoku yang uh chachu thank you very much for joining the broadcast and thank you everyone for joining the broadcast today very much humbled by your support every day and coming on and watching the broadcast without you i would not be productive to do anything so thank you for joining the broadcast i'll see you again tomorrow same time uh 4 p.m um paul okay i don't want to mention the other name because i may not mention it well paul you said well done thank you very much paul thank you very much you know let's continue to share the broadcast with others so we can together help everybody and as much as more people available out there so every single day every weekday from monday to friday 4 p.m i'm going to go live on my youtube channel like this and i'll be teaching things so if there are any topics you want me to cover put it in the chat box this is a question somebody asked this is a standard that someone said i should teach live that is why i've taken my time to go through all the principles so if there is anything on your heart any topic on your on your mind in your back end things that you want me to cover just put it in the comment box i'll be very much excited to teach it live here and we're going to be doing this from now till you write the exam so you can imagine how much we can cover during this period if really you provide me with the topics that you want me to look out for in relation to that don't give me subjects okay subject is too vague subject is too broad so just give me topics that you want us to cover and i'll be very much excited to cover so tomorrow we're going to be continuing with this standard and definitely i'll talk about something else based on the topics i have here from the students thank you very much for joining the broadcast once again and i'll see you same time tomorrow remember subscribe to the channel share the channel with others we want to build this community to become a one-stop shop literally for students writing their professional qualification examination so when they come to this channel they know that they are getting everything they want everything they need for them to prepare well for the examination thank you very much and i'll see you same time tomorrow on the business lecture in Woodin show as we continue our journey towards the ICA May 2020 examination and certainly beyond that time.